Welcome to the Forward Ever podcast, where we highlight African immigrant leaders in New York and make visible the interests of Africans in New York's immigrant community. My name is Yata Kizolu, and you're hearing the sounds of Yakuba Sisoko. In this episode, hosted by Amrita Khan, hear how Fatumata Wagyu's upbringing in the Bronx inspired her mission of bridging African and African-American communities together to fight against systemic white supremacy in America, as well as the legal work she partook in during her time with ACT to fight anti-immigrant rhetoric against African immigrants in New York City under the Trump administration. Hi, everyone. Today we'll be interviewing a special guest, and it's March 31st at 9 p.m. And my name's Amrita, and I'll give the microphone to Fatu so she can introduce herself. For sure. Uh, my name is Fatu, Fatu Age. I am, an, I am a first-gen Gambian American from the Bronx, New York. I am currently a lawyer. I recently graduated from law school this past May, went to school here in New York City, and I've always been very committed and dedicated to using, you know, my knowledge, tools, and resources for advancing the issues that concern African immigrants the most. I had the privilege of working as an organizer for ACT before law school, and I was able to work on a lot of the anti-immigration rhetoric that we were receiving on the national end from President Trump. Yeah, and I'm very happy to be here and speak more with you about my, you know, interest and the importance um, and impact that African immigrants have had here in New York City and beyond. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Fatu. So we're just gonna go a little bit backwards in your life and talk about where and when you were born. For sure. I was born in the Bronx, New York. Um, As I mentioned, I'm first gen Gambian American, so my parents immigrated here from the Gambia, West Africa. Um, and like most African, West, West African immigrants, they settled here in the South, in, in the South um, West Bronx area. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about your childhood? For sure. Um, my child was great. I'm, I'm actually still living in a neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, so it's always very interesting to see how things have changed, but then how things have remained the same. So um, my neighborhood was like an is an enclave of West African immigrants from all over, from Gambia, Senegal, Mali, Guinea, Ghana, Nigeria. So I've always grew up in a community that had a strong emphasis on West African Black pride. Um, my community was also is also mixed with other Black immigrant communities, specifically folks from the Dominican Republic and other parts of the Caribbean. Um, there's also a strong indigenous native Black community that's here as well. So I felt like I've always grew up seeing Blackness in a, in a very like powerful way, in a way that was like, you know, transnational. And I also grew up in like a Muslim community um, growing up around like a number of uh, mosques um, in the neighborhood. And going to mosque with like my siblings and cousins and neighbors was like a key part of my childhood during the weekends. Yeah, and I grew up in the Fordham area, Fordham section of the Bronx. So I felt like I always grew up and the Fordham sections consider like the key shopping center area of the city of the of the Bronx. So I've always grew up, um, you know, just being surrounded around like an active, busy part of the city. Yeah, that sounds like New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think one one question I kind of have is I guess like do you think that upbringing has influenced who you are as a person today? For sure. I think it definitely has. I think our one's upbringing upbringing has a way of like exposing them to certain issues. Um and I think it also plays a key part in your identity formation, like how you view yourself and how you view the world. And I feel like because of my upbringing, I have I was able to like get like a firsthand glimpse into like certain issues that I, that I realized affected people of color, immigrants, Muslims, Black immigrants generally. And I think also, as I mentioned, like growing up with a, a grown up or in a community surrounded around like a diverse group of Blackness and a number of West African immigrants also played a key role and how I viewed myself as a Black Muslim, as a daughter of immigrants. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think um, your up your surroundings and environment plays a key role in your upbringing. Yeah, 
I feel like from from a very young age, you like embrace like these identities that you've hold. Was there like a moment or a time where you felt or a story that you can share about that? Or was there a time where you felt like there were challenges that came up because of the identities that you've held? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, as I mentioned, like my community was diverse in the sense that we had a a significant Black immigrant community. And then we also had an Indigenous Native African-American community. And I remember, even till today, I still see like the tension that exists between the two communities, um, which is obviously fueled by, you know, like white supremacy overall. And I think being someone who found myself in the middle where I felt like I, you know, I would come home and it would be like, I would come home to a West African household. But then in, at school, like I would learn about the civil rights movement. I would have a significant, a, num- a significant number of friends who were, you know, African-American. And that was like, you know, the culture that I consumed, the culture that I, you know, naturally gravitated towards as a, as a young Black person growing up in America. Um, so I found myself in the middle in many ways. And, and I, and I found that like, and then in some ways, like even coming home and even c- come into like others, smaller West African circles, like hearing like, you know, the negative messaging that individuals, certain individuals have around like black, um, African Americans. And then also like being in African American circles and thinking about like, you know, the, sh- the notions and ideas that individuals have of Africa as well. That's like, you know, very much fueled by like what they see on the media or messaging that's like very much rooted in colonialism and stuff. So I felt like for me, that's something that I always think deeply about um, with my experience on my upbringing, where it kind of made me this individual who like, you know, as I mentioned, sees their blackness beyond just being West African, like sees it in a more diasporic lens um, and has always been very intentional on how we can bridge the divide between the two communities. And even during my time at ACT, um, this was something that I, and this is why I also really love the work that ACT is doing because it's helping bring the voice of Black immigrants into the immigration movement, but also like, also hoping to bring the voice of Black immigrants into the racial justice movement, because I feel like there is a void there. And um, and I think this experience has just like made me more intentional on how I can, you know, work to bridge the divide between the two, whether it's in my personal or professional life. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I feel like, mm-hmm. I feel like that's definitely like two um, unique parts of you know like your your American life and like you're engaging with like African-American students in the classroom and then you're engaging with your African household and you've like really thought about ways in which you can like mesh the two because you saw that there was like this common problem that they're both facing which is white supremacy. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah, I guess you already started talking about it, so we can sort of, like, head in that direction. Um, how has, you know, this upbringing or, like, this perspective you have led you to act and sort of, like, what work, what works did you do while you were there? Mm-hmm, for sure. So given my upbringing, I've always seen the need to, like, address certain issues that affects affect people who look like me or people who've had experiences similar to my parents. So I always knew that I wanted to be an advocate and I felt like um, the law would be the best route to go um, about that. So during college, I was very intentional engaging in a number of social justice projects and just like building my vocabulary and understanding around like, you know, systemic racism, class warfare here in the U.S. and like also like, you know, histories of like, um, histories such as colonialism, slavery, and thinking about how those continue to impact and, you know, disenfranchise people of color here in the U.S. or even like abroad. And I think from building that, like, you know, social justice perspective, it kind of it influenced me to want to go to law school. So I was very intentional with like internship experiences, community engagement efforts that I did here in the Bronx and in the Bronx and in the city overall, and then decided to apply for law school. And then during my time at, I didn't, I got into law school, but then um, Donald Trump was elected. And then I remember I, Amaha actually gave me the offer to start at ACT. 
the day after elections. And I thought that was like um, very telling um, in many ways. And that encouraged me to like take it more, take the opportunity more. So I decided to defer for a year. Um, and then worked then during my time at ACT, like, you know, was able to work on a number of the anti-immigrant um, objectives that we were receiving on a national level, but also like making sure to, up, to hold um, local govern, government, like the mayor, city council members, um, state assembly, state senators um, accountable, making sure that New York City was actually a sanctuary city, because that was like the slogan everyone was saying. Um, when Donald Trump was elected, that you know New York City was a sanctuary city, but making sure that you know immigrants um, were able to access city council services and um, things, um, local local services and things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that. Makes yeah. Sense. No, that made sense. Um, what are some projects that you like specifically worked on? Yeah, for sure. So I worked on a language access campaign, and we were able to open up. Um, New York City services um, for city agencies to a number of African immigrants where we were able to include French and Arabic. And I also was able to work on, we put together a coalition with faith leaders, other immigrant groups, other legal advocacy organizations where we were raising attention to the refugee ban um, and the Muslim ban. And then I think it was like right at the tail end of my time at ACT. We also were, um, and I really didn't engage much in that. There were also like some around preserving DACA and TPS as well for uh, for um, immigrants from specific countries. Yeah, that seems like a lot. You were working on a lot. What was maybe one of the most challenging things or like moments of working on projects like that? Um... I think some of the most challenging things were, I feel like there was a point with having a president who was like, just a t- every day there was like a new assault to our community, um, where it would, it would become tiring and it was, it can breed like exhaustion and like a lack of motivation. So finding a way to stay motivated um, and find it a way to stay committed to the larger goal. And even sometimes like when you do get the little wins, like feeling like realizing that it's a part of a larger picture and a larger agenda was something that I had to like intentionally keep in mind because it could, it was, it was very easy to get defeated, especially because like literally every second, like there was like a new assault to our community. Yeah. And I guess how, how did you deal with that? Mm-hmm. I think the most beautiful thing about that time period was like the community that I was able to build. And I think the community was so supportive and helping get through that moment. I think finding and having like other allies and fellow advocates who, you know, kept what kept who we were able to like keep each other grounded and um, support one another. Sure. Like, you know, we all were like taken care of. Like, for example, I remember we ended up um, hosting a number of um, rallies and like interfaith iftars during Ramadan and just like thinking about like how supportive people were for me during that time um, was also key. So I think it was definitely the people, the community, including the allies and the advocates that definitely helped keep keep one another supported and motivated during that time. That's That's nice. It's always nice to find community. I'm thinking about fast forward to like right now in the present, a new presidency and sort of like, what do you think are some of the challenges that people from your community are currently facing right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I'm glad you asked that question, Marita, because I feel like, to be honest, they're facing the same issues that they did under a a Trump presidency. But I would maybe say that there's like not that um, level of intensity to it, maybe, or like fear that we had before but I think clearly the United States has a deportation machine and clearly criminal immigration is a real reality for people of color especially black immigrants so there is that aspect so in in the broad scheme of things like have our realities changed maybe not so much but then I don't also like want to underestimate like the amount like the level of fear that I feel like has like you know dissipated because we no longer have Um, Trump in office. Um, But I would say I am the thing that I do worry about is that I think like I, I, I fear that people feel like the end goal was to get Trump out of office, which I think 
isn't the thing. Like, I think um, we want, like, we want to have, like, you know, just immigration policies. We want to end the prison, the uh, school to prison pipeline. We want to, like, you know, resolve a lot of the issues that um, our community continues to face. And I fear that, like, you know, because we no longer have, like, you know, this individual who was, like, the clear like it was it was always clear to like point fingers at Trump as the problem because we no longer have him that individual people can like get I don't want to say like apathetic but like can get uh I guess uh, for lack of better words I use apathetic about politics and I and I do get it I think we do need like a breather at a moment for now because like the past four years have been like very heavy for many of us but I hope that like after some breather, we do hold um, Biden accountable and we do like address like the issues because the realities are pretty much still the same. Yeah, I agree. I feel like um, similar to what you mentioned, Trump was like the main person that people felt, you know, like they can just target. And once he's gone, these things, you know, may feel like they're ended or they're just like not as intense. But as you clearly mentioned, it's still actually happening. Mm hmm. Exactly, exactly. Another question along the lines of what is something that's that you're really concerned about, you know, like looking forward in the future in terms of like immigration, in terms of like the African community in New York? Is there anything that you're concerned about for the future? I just, not something I'm concerned about. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm still very hopeful for the future of African immigrants here in the U.S., um, here in New York City in particular. I feel like we are a key aspect of this city. Like, we are, we have found, like, you know, a way to, like, mold this city to be our own and to also bring in, like, you know, our rich culture, history, and identity into it. Like, for example, if you go through parts of the Bronx, if you go through, um, Harlem, for example, you see like you it feels like it's called Little Africa because if in many ways it feels like you're in Senegal or walking down the streets of like Senegal and Mali. So I love that we've been able to do that for ourselves as a community. Um, and I know we still continue to face like a significant number of challenges around, you know, just being in the U.S. because of like, you know, the xenophobia and the racism that exists. But I think as a community, we've also like excelled in some ways, like where I do see a number of like first gen, second gen um, African children of African immigrants like myself who are, you know, like, you know, who are like, you know, succeeding or who are like, you know, being very committed to like bettering the realities of our community. And I know there's also like the opposite end of that, where we, where um, some of our youth are still falling to like, you know, uh, a lot of the violence and issues in our community, but I like just to like highlight the positive. Like I, I'm very like hopeful for that. I hope we can have like more representation, more political representation, because I think with that will come power, and with that will come like you know our voice being brought to a larger to you know to to a larger scale, and to like and hopefully having like you know our issues and needs addressed but um overall i'm really hopeful for our community and i hope that like you know we can be very intentional in terms of working with other immigrants and groups in terms of working with um african american communities to bridge the divide that exists um yeah i think you make you make really good points and is there um any like future projects or issues that you feel people can do anything to like start to address them um, I think a lot of them have been addressed in a sense. Like I think of organizations like ACT are amazing. Um, and I think there are other organizations out there like Saltier to African Services Committee that are being very intentional about providing legal and other direct so um, social services to our community. I would just echo that like it would be great if we could have like more like political a civic engagement, some sort of civic empowerment happening in our community, because I feel like there is a number of African immigrants who are gaining access to citizenship um, and who are gaining access to, but aren't able to have like, you know, the tools and resources and knowledge they need to like actually have a strong political voice. That, yeah, that makes sense. 
I think those are like the main questions I've had for you. I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add or there was like a specific question. Um, no, not anything else that I would like to add, but um, I don't know. I just, just to add that, like to your point about like the future, I know it act, um, act is very good at, um, with the slogan of forwards ever backwards, never. And I don't know. I, that's something that I often think deeply about and carry with me even after act. And I think if anything, it just hits on, we're, we're resilient people. Like our, our community, like, you know, many of us came from like trials and tribulations from back home. And then we still come here to the U S and find a way to make it for ourselves and for our families. Um, and not to like glorify, like, you know, our struggle in many ways, but just to highlight that we're resilient people. And I think, um, that resiliency will live on for generations to come. Um, so that's why I'm really hopeful for, you know, the future of African immigrants here in New York city. And I think, and I seen this, especially during my time at Aqua, sadly, sometimes when we would be engaging with like political leaders or certain stakeholders, they wouldn't see our community's voices and needs as necessary. And I don't know, maybe because we didn't have like, you know, that political power that other groups have. But I think that that isn't that sh- that in any way does not like underestimate the power and great contributions that African immigrants continue to have in New York City, the United States and Africa and African people generally continue to have in history. Historically, we were, you know, we have, we contributed to world history and we it said that that's where um, human life began. And just like generally, like the contribution of black people generally all over in this world. So, yeah, I'll leave it to that. I think, yeah, I think you make some very valid points. And I, I also, I'm, I'm really glad that like we got to interview you because I felt like, you know, it's such a um, interesting perspective that I feel like a lot of young people like share, you know, especially like during this, Mm -hmm. especially during like COVID and BLM and like sort of like immigration policies. I feel like students um, that are similar to like your background are thinking about the same topics. So I feel like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. I think, um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, Thank you so much for doing this and, you know, for sharing our community stories and recording it. Um, I think it's a very beautiful project and I look forward to like, you know, seeing how it all turns out. Thank you so much, Fatu, for being a part of the Ford Ever podcast and for taking time out of your night to share your story with us and how you've helped the African community in New York City. We appreciate it so much. Thanks for listening to the Ford Ever Podcast, a collaboration between African Communities Together and Barnard College. To learn more about African Communities Together and the many ways you can support our mission, visit our website at africans.us or follow us on social media. Our social media handle on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter is Africans US. Like, comment, and share. Forward ever, backwards never.